So I'm Simon Gordon from AX. K is a bit a strange relation here. There's, I don't actually see any of our users here. There's a few people who've messed with it, but nobody who uses K or Q in their daily lives. But I assumed as well, as I was the last at the end of a long day, and as I had to follow Roger as well, which is a far back. Usually I'm set up by having to follow up and win. <laughs> similar thing we stuck with. But I thought rather than talking about some obscure KDB plus and KQ idioms, I talk about just the more general thing of just, well, big data and the problems that's causing and the sort of machines that have to be running. So it's especially it's dealing with everybody's having to deal with millions or billions, we're talking about billions of records at the moment, and it's even coming towards trillions. That this is something that's in your futures within the next year. So what I want to do first then is to show you just a bit to give a, an idea of what I'm blathering about. A quick demo on the database of New York Stock Exchange tactics. Just one or two queries. The thing to look at is sort of how many records there are and how fast it goes, not um, any particularly clever algorithms. So let's try it. This is connected up to a server somewhere in the cloud. It's on Amazon. So I don't actually know where it is. It's somewhere in America, but not in Europe. It's It's about a year and a half's worth of stock attack data. It's from the beginning of last year to well, this weekend. We just updated every weekend because it's a demo. It's not real. It's, it's the real data, but it's not something that we're actually doing anything from except demonstrating. So if I First, just what the tables are there is the usual. Sorry. That's the trade table. Just the usual stuff the dates, symbol, price, price, size, small. If I now select that, yeah, trade, as today it is the Apple. Developers conference. I just pick out the minimum price, the maximum price by date from the trade where. Where's this month? I'm just crap. And that's picked those out. That's, it's all in SQL, it's a bit boring. There's some more canned ones here. That's doing the same thing again, just for Google and Apple. Now the only interesting thing here with this is how many records are there. If I find where I stored the list of tables in the root namespace here are just the main ones of trade and quote and the MBBO, that's the best we can offer. That's the number of records there. If I Get that line back and sum it up. That God knows what that number is. If we get that line back and it's two hundred and eighty six billion records. <laughs> That's not nothing. That's, that's about all I wanted to show there. People want to play with this more. 
then you kind of test on the outcome and see whether you can still get them right. So if I go back to where I hid presentations. So that's about seven terabytes of data. <laughs> and you think that sounds like a lot for that many records, but actually it's not. The last time I got a backup uh, disk for my laptop here, I just paid for about 100 francs, and I got a one terabyte disk. So what you pay for with that much storage is having fast disks. But that much is nothing special. It's just seven terabytes is not a big deal. If somebody had this properly for the whole History, then it goes back about 15 years. <coughs> Why that's interesting for Europe as well is that the first time I gave a talk like this was uh, for more at the Dialogue Conference in 2006. And this is showing how the number of records are going up for that data collection. And 2006 was then here. And then back, on, back when I gave that talk, it was, well, you know, look how this data volume is growing. This is going to get really big one day. <coughs> and it has. It's now. In last November, that was 1.1 billion records per day. And it wasn't just one peak, because things like that could happen, things like that, some smaller peaks there. That was up, and then staying up, and it's going along. So that was was full time for ATL programs. So that amount of data, you know, kids can work with it, but their parents have more trouble. With it. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, my name is Dr. E. Here's the one, you'll notice that the current study warhead has gone missing. If you want it back, you're going to have to pay me one million dollars. Sorry. <laughs> so only one country has managed that so far, and there is one as well, but Zimbabwe. <laughs> and this whole thing with millions, billions, trillions, people really don't get it. They tend to think that, yeah, a billion, that's, you know, so that's quite a few million, that's more than ten. And then a trillion is sort of a bit more. But one nice example that makes that clear is just the number of seconds. If you have a million seconds, that's about 12 days. A billion seconds is coming on for 32 years. Um, you know, that wasn't that long ago. That was when Google was still hand delivering your search results. <laughs> 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 Sorry, a trillion seconds is straight a thousand times more. So that's 32,000 years. So that's back to you know, even before Java. <laughs> is it why well, we even have these now? A hundred trillion dollar note. That was when I was looking around on the internet for the hundred billion one, I found this and, and realized they got that far. <laughs> so now what uh, quickly some things about KDB Plus, this what this is running on, because it's very similar. What you have, I'm not going to go into the detail much, but it's still only a command line problem. We, we only concentrate on getting the speed, nothing else. There's uh, an Excel interface, uh, there's GUI stuff, like always. <laughs> <laughs> there's R graphics, there's an IDE, there's an Eclipse interface. But all of that stuff is outside. And I'm not going to talk much more about it because on kx.com, there's this our 32-bit version, you can just download now for non commercial use and play with it. There's, on this thing, somewhere I hope there's a document with some links in it we can go and grab the 32-bit version. There's a book about KDB Plus that uh, was written by a user. When he got fed up with having to explain stuff, so he just kept notes as he was teaching people. That's online as well, code.kx.com. You can just go there and read it, our complete library. 
And then the problem, really, that I want to talk about now, because, like I said, I'm assuming you will be in a sugar rush and pretty tired by now. <coughs> Not prepared to listen to much. It was just this whole thing with handling these data volumes. What most people think of is, you know, the, if there's a crazy amount of data, then you have to start using stuff like C, C++. And it really, it's not working for, I'll get to that in a minute why. And we, the array languages, are much better. We have our own little world and stay there. And the people programming in normal languages, they have such low expectations. <laughs> their code is just rubbish as well. The part of the reason why now is that there's very different hardware coming up from what we've been used to for, let's say, 20, 30 years ago. It's like some people have said here today. There um, this isn't this thing of the hardware getting faster and faster and faster. It's just going sideways track more and more cores. So you have to be looking to optimize the parallelism. And the other thing you have to be very careful with is, it's this thing Morton said as well, if you have just two cores or four cores, if your data is shifting around a bit and this calculation starts on this core and then moves a bit over there and left something in the cache over there, that's it's a bit crappy and you get this falling off of the performance like Morton said. But if you have 128 cores or some 56 or 1,000, you're completely sunk because your data is just ambling around the whole machine, festooning various bits of cache with data. It's a total mess and uh, there's no simple solution for it. You, you can't um, surface the ability to mess with that for ordinary programs. We always say the best search constraint from something like these big databases is just a boolean part for self if it's a finance database. You, just, you don't want to be shipping around billions of rows. You just want to tell what the APL server or whatever, what calculation you want, and it will give you the data. The important thing with this is that smart compilers just aren't going to fix this. Because the problem is. A smart compiler will look at the individual bits of what's going on, but it doesn't have the overview of what the high-level language is going to If you start a calculation, say over here on the line, you sort some data, and you're a C++ programmer, then you've lost the fact that, that was sorted by the time you get farther down the line. So the fact, if you've got, let's say, then a max reduce on that data, it will have to zip through all the data and find the maximum value, instead so of just doing a minus one k. That's a bit exaggerated, but it's that sort of thing. If you use a low-level language and you program in that, you tend to think in that style of programming, you're doing it because you'll be just calculating on far, far too much data. So we have, all of us, have a slightly different way of looking at data from normal programmers. And I've got here just a quote. This is from... Niall Dalton, who some of you know him, he worked for AX for a while, when he got tempted away by a hardware manufacturer offering him uh, to make magic hardware for him, he couldn't refuse. And he said, uh, to retire, I need programmers to use a concise notation that describes a sequential composition of nested data parallel operations. Instead of that, we have programmers using awful verbose notation to describe step by obscure step the parallel composition of sequential operations, and I get headaches trying to untangle it automatically in software and hardware. So I need programmers to use APL, please. <laughs> That's from a hardware manufacturer, not from an APL vendor or the great language. So we keep telling people this, but they aren't listening. We go along, we've been going back visiting for 20, 30 years. Never been and then you see things like this, and it makes you realize where the problem is. I don't, you probably can't read that from the back. It's somebody on some bulletin board <laughs> somewhere just complaining that the RAN function in ASP.net is returning a different value every time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what can we do with you? 
<laughs> yeah, this is the sort of systems they end up with. <laughs> <laughs> so now, I want to talk very carefully about part of what the solution is. There's this sort of, not talking about it, isn't going to do anything. We go out on the streets telling people what wonderful location we have, and they won't listen, they don't care. We have very special skills. <laughs> <laughs> and the most important thing of all is this hand notation, as the tool thought. That's our real um, secret weapon that people don't realize how useful it is. And if you talk about this normally, most people say, oh yeah, it's really important. And they mumble a bit, and they show you the characters. Some fool makes a joke about live noise and thinks it's the first time anyone's made that joke. Hit you before you can carry on. You know from, well, talking about Ken stuff, it's always, first is the grammar, the spelling, the meaning, and stuff like that is important. We all know that. But talking about this with Arthur recently, he pointed out as well, it's really important, the data types. But if it's got to be a tool for thought, if you have to be faffing about decoding integers into dates or timestamps and stuff, it's not a tool for thought anymore. It's a tool for hacking about and faffing about. You can't have a clear picture in your mind. And the same with, well, now I'm blowing our trumpet with KD Plus, with things like having a table as a base of data type. If you've got that, it allows you to just chunk up an idea and then you finish with it. If you have to be storing tables as arrays and then you faff about with them, or you even have to keep them out in the database and go load you can see it and back in again. You don't got a tool for thought anymore, you've got something for faffing about with and it takes too long, it's too difficult. The other important tool is composition, that's this well J does that far better than APL or than K. Things like hopes and forks, they're magic, I wish we had them as well. The other important tool is abstraction. Okay. If it's a tool for thought, you must be able to abstract the stuff. So now. <laughs> so now I've got an offer for you, a special offer for you. I'm going to rush this. <laughs> yeah, this, I'll have to skip over this. <laughs> no, no, not the that was coming still, but some of the background to it. That was some, an Arthur story. But, now, this important thing here is with, if it's a notation as a tool for thought, then it's no use if you have your really clever ideas in the shower or when you're walking around with a dog or something. Once every nine months, this is a friend of mine who gave an interview to a, a finance magazine not long ago. And he was just talking about this talk, that is, his light bulb moment. And they were asking him, yeah, the last big one I had was nine months ago. And that's, that's terrible. If you're a, a typical good programmer, let's say you have a, a programming life of 10 years before you're mispromoted to be a manager and waste the rest of your life. So that means you're going to have 10 good ideas, um, or 11, maybe. What a waste. There must be a better way of doing that, of using your skill to see stuff in it from a very high level and abstract something more useful out from it. Using the fact that you, you know and work and think with this, these notations, the APL or JLK is the same thing. And in a way, it's, um, well really it's intuition, but it's got such a bad name that there's no other word to describe it. But <laughs> that one already. So, People tend to think that intuition is either sort of a one or a zero sort of thing. Either you have a good idea and the whole application comes bang, delivered in a lump, or intuition is a crap anyway, you just have to sit there and hack away at it till you get it working. And of course the reality is a bit different, something in between. What you want is you want to get the idea for the thing, but that should really come bang, as a really brilliant idea. But then, of course, you have to test it out first and keep working around <laughs> So to go back to how you get these ideas, what we should be doing, because of all this amount of data we have to be working with, we should be looking at being able to get good ideas far more quickly, far more easily. 
And luckily, my wife's a psychotherapist and stuff as well, and we've been, I've been interested in this stuff for years. And people think that there's, that there's no way, it's either you have your clever ideas, or you, know, you can have it, it's great, you think about it a bit, and then there's nothing in between. Then, after you've had the idea, then you just have to go and sit down and start typing, and that's the end of it. But there's actually ways around it, and it's got some quite interesting stuff you can do. So the first thing, of course, is you have to do your research anyway, and that's you know, reading all the books, Googling stuff, um, doing your mind maps, whatever you normally do. And now, the rest of this is a thing that was actually taught by a guy called uh, Gerald Lee about 30 years ago. It's a technique called focusing. And unfortunately, it's been totally forgotten. It's really brilliant, and nobody knows about it anymore. The first thing you have to do is, having, having done your research, then you just sort of, you know, if you like, tell yourself that, right now, everything else that comes in is really not important at the moment. You come back to it in 10 minutes' time. It over there. So if you get a good idea, you don't go wandering off goodness knows where. Then, so you've got all your, your research, you've got the idea fixed in your head. Now the next thing you need to do is to get a word or a phrase, something really short that describes it. And that's again where having something like APL is really good for you because you're able to um, summarize these things as maybe just an algorithm, maybe a description, just a drawing, whatever. Something very concise. And then you just polish it a bit by you have so this whole idea, this thing, this problem that's bugging you, and you have the word or phrase that fits with it. And you just in your head just keep checking it. Does it fit quite? Does it describe it? And if not, then you change it. You just keep backwards and forwards until you've got it. And it's important that it's a word. It's not, you can't say that from things like NLP, is it more, for people with different modalities, it could be a picture or a smell or something. This, this is different, it should really be a word that you can use. It's like a, a key to just get the idea back again. And why this is a bit, it's not as obvious and stupid as it sounds, it's that this is different because it's, you've then got a handle on the idea, and it's not a memory. Because if you had a brilliant idea in the shower in the morning, and then when you come to start coming about it, Half, an extra, half a day later, you have the memory of the idea you had. That's a different thing from having a real key there to kick up the thing and have it in your mind now. And it's not some fantasy idea of something in the future that would be really cool if I had an algorithm to do this or that. It's really something right there now, and it should really stick in your head like some dismal ad or something that you, you detest yourself for seeing it's picking up and the thing is just there. <coughs> Then what you do is you just have to take that key, that idea you've got, and you sort of well, you know, bounce it around in your head. And just you've got now this key. Just have it in your head. You've already said nothing else is important at the moment. You can come back to it five minutes later if a good idea comes, and you just hold it there, and then think of nothing or nothing much else. And then if some other thoughts come in, just bring this key idea back again. And you just do that for a minute or two, a couple of minutes. And then some idea, exactly like these ideas that you get in the shower, will be just pop into your head. And if it doesn't work the first few times, then that's not so bad because you've got it here. Something will pop up later in the day. Just try it a few times. If we had a bit more time, we would go through it. If you get the idea. It's Nothing very much here. It's just the trick is we need to realize it's important to have this really good idea and just pester it till it gives you an idea back again. And what you've got then is sort of a way of communicating a bit more with your subconscious without having to go by and taking the dog for a walk or anything like that. And then when you've got this picture, then you've got something that when you start coding, you can continually go back to it and check where you are and what's going on. And you polish it again, there's nothing fixed about it. Then, it's not a picture, it's a word. So, sorry, you said it's not a picture, it's not an idea, it's not a, it's a word. It's, it's a word, and then you use that. But then, something like a picture, or a movie, or a daydream, will pop into your head. But you use this to kick yourself with. 
you keep the key, you don't yeah. then go on. Because you're going to keep coming back to that. That's the nice thing about it. It's not like a memory of, oh, that was really cool that day nine months ago. Or something like that. So then you can really start coping properly and get stuff done. So the benefits of this is that it's not things like the UML tool or God knows what that you have to <laughs> wheel up in a, in a lorry to, to install and run. You just got it in your head all the time, really. And these, how you use your own favorite location to do it, whatever you're comfortable with. And, yeah, yeah. So the other things to do with this is first, of course, just do it. <laughs> so to write it in, it's, you get the idea, and then of course you test it. And once you've done this a few times, you've got a whole pile of these keys so you get a better and better feel for what works for you. And it goes easier and easier. So it's after a few times, this whole description is irrelevant because it's just a thing you've got in the tool. And then you can just have this easier communication with your ideas. And so you have to keep doing it. And from talking to lots of other programmers, this is not something a lot of people do. I would assume most people work this way. And I talked with after it. It was quite shocked to find the way that most people work what what this really support came from. So if it doesn't work for you, then that's fine too. Just have a drink afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and this is just a reminder of so stay thinking and programming at a very high level, don't go dropping down <coughs> coding too quickly. Well done. Well done. Yeah. Questions?